Hi, I'm Jeremy Thake, and with me today is Jeremy Kelly. Hi, thanks for having me. You're welcome, mate. We're going to today talk about the OneDrive APIs inside of the Microsoft Graph, uh, which Jeremy's the PM of, which is the perfect time to kind of grab you and have you in here. Yeah, we uh, we have a lot of support for working with files in Graph. Um, OneDrive has has been an early adopter of Graph, I'd like to, to think. Um, and so one of the things we're really proud of is if you're working with files in OneDrive, it applies both to business and consumer accounts, which is great. You don't have to worry about which user logged in if you're building a solution that needs to target both, or if you just want to learn how they, they both work. There are very few differences between them. And why would a developer want to use these? Like in my past life as a developer with consultants and um, with customers on the other side of the fence, we would store files in blob storage or even in database blobs back yep. in the day. But what are some of the advantages of actually putting these files inside of OneDrive? OneDrive for business in particular, you're getting a lot of the value that comes with Office 365 and, sh and to a certain degree, SharePoint features as well. So you're mm -hmm. getting a, a nice store that includes versions and permissions and other, other items like that that you then don't have to manage yourself. The system can take care of that for you. Um, on the consumer side, there's just a whole lot of opportunity for working with files, writing apps that can read and write directly uh, into the OneDrive store. Um, as a complement to the APIs, we also offer file picker components that integrate through Graph. So we've used these in first party experiences that we then share out for third parties to use as well. Yeah. Um, so you can take advantage of Graph whether you know it or not by using some of those components. Right. Rather than building your own UI yeah. to try and manage uploading a file, you've got the yep. drag and drop and yep. so forth. Or opening a file. Um, and then in terms of the storage, like that cost of say, your application running you know, 100 gig of files, that's the customer's tenant that's going to get stored in? Yeah, so generally, um, depending on how you architect your storage, um, you're basically passing the cost on to us. Um, you're you're using the, the storage that we offer, which you store your personal files in the OneDrive uh, locations. And if you have shared files, those go, to, go into SharePoint team sites. And it's the same API for working with files regardless of how they're stored there. Um, so the path might be a little different to the file, but the actual mechanics of uploading, downloading, managing those files are all the same regardless of how it's stored. So you can work with the right information architecture for your solution um, and not have to worry too much about coding differently against it. And you made a good point that you mentioned Teams as well as SharePoint. Like yep. um, when you go to the Files tab in any team, those yep. files are in those OneDrive are all, or SharePoint. All OneDrive and SharePoint files, so those are all backed by the same API. Right. Um, with the Drive uh, path in in Graph is the the starting point for all things files. So whether you've come from Team Group. SharePoint site, me so for my personal stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's all basically the same. That's awesome. And then another common question I get is around like how big a file can I put across the wire or rest? Like what's the mechanisms if I've got like a 100 meg Word file that I want to push in there? Is that just going to happen in one Rex call or right. the different so ways to handle it? You can go anything up to four megabytes you can do in a single put. Yep. So you can use typical HTTP put to get a, a small file up. For anything larger than that, we have a create upload session API, which allows you to do chunked upload, mm -hmm. which is also resumable. So it makes it just more reliable for um, transferring large files. And you can go up to whatever the current file size limit is in OneDrive and SharePoint using that API. So you can get pretty large files if you need to. That's awesome. And small files are pretty trivial. It's generally easier if you know you're going to do large files, just plan for using create upload session rather than the, mm -hmm. the single file upload. Um, but if you know you're working with small data, you can also use that if it's more convenient for you. That's great. So um, as usual, Graph Explorer is the best place to demo yep. Microsoft Graph API. So do you want to show Yeah, us? we've got a, a couple different scenarios we can walk through. Just a, the basic things you'd expect to be able to do with a file. That's awesome. All right, so let's take a look at some demos. We've got a SharePoint communication site here, which is the default site in my tenant. You can see in the path that... There's no an extra information there. Um, and we can see there's a bunch of document libraries, there's an events list, and we wanna play with this in Graph. So let's take a look at how we do that with Graph Explorer. 
The default path in Graph Explorer is me. In this case, I want the SharePoint sites, which are not me, obviously. The primary root in SharePoint is everything is going to be under the sites node. So sites is where we home all of the different sites uh, across the, the tenancy. So if I want that default site that we were just looking at, I can go sites root, pretty easy. And if we want to find all those libraries and lists that we were just looking at, we can add slash lists. And this will now enumerate all the different lists that are available in this site collection. So if we look down here, we can see here's the demo docs full uh, library. Here's the documents. We have the, uh, that events list we saw. Here's the design document library for JT files. I think we date JT design documents. I think we saw that in the list. So this now gives me all of the top level nodes for all of the different lists. And with SharePoint list data, I can work on all the different columns that are, that are available and I could add columns as well. So let's take a look at a particular list. So we're gonna go lists. We're gonna just grab the ID of this first one, the demo docs. I'm gonna copy this. I'll paste it into the URL. Great, now I've got the more detailed information specifically about that list. And I can see its parent reference, so I know what site it belongs to. And typically when we address sites in, in the Graph API, we use three bits of information together, um, which for SharePoint long time experienced users, this will make sense for everyone else. Just pretend it's a really long string that you get out of the API and pass it back in. But we use your, your tenant domain and then we have both a site collection and site ID uh, that together are two GUIDs that uniquely identify where in the system that site is. We're gonna look at how to access sites by path in a little bit because that's much easier in, in many cases mm -hmm. uh, to make that work. Uh, but we do we do provide it here. So that's the parent reference for the site. And we can look at this happens to be a document library. So we can see there's a template there. It's not hidden and content types are not enabled. Again, all the 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 nitty gritty of SharePoint you can really get access to through the, the API here. Um, so if we wanted to look at what columns are actually on this list, again, pretty straightforward. I can ask for the columns. And when I do that, it will give me the information about what group a given column is in, what its display name is, again, whether it's hidden, indexed, you know, the, the information I would need to know to work with the data that's in it. Uh, and, if, and this will allow you to kind of create columns or modify yeah. existing ones. Yep. So if I were looking here, um, there's the compliance asset ID column. And in this case, it's saying uh, it's a text column but allow multiple lines is set to false. So I could easily modify this column uh, to change that value to true if that were, were what I wanted to do. Yep. Um, if we go back up a level, if instead of looking at the column definitions, I actually wanna look at the items that are in this, this list, uh, I can just go to the items array and it's gonna return back all the, the information about the things that are here. Um, and in this case, so I'm going to get the created by, the modified by, um, what else do we have here? We have, again have a parent and a content type. And you'll see that by default we don't return all of the data in the list. That's a performance optimization. I can request it if I know that I need it and I know that I'm working with a data set that isn't going to, to be overly taxing. Uh, so I could add an expand parameter here. I think OData is a little happier when it's a dollar sign. We can expand equals fields. And so now you can see the size of my scroll bar jumped. So if we look at one of these items, we're gonna scroll down a little bit and here's all the different column data for this particular item. Right. So I got the doc icon, the, the file size display, um, all the different data that's stored for this item now came back in one query. You could use a select statement and yep, just pick you can, certain fields to even make that more Yep, efficient. and we definitely recommend doing that. Yeah. Um, in particular, uh, SharePoint data is pretty straightforward, so you can get most of the data back pretty easily. When you're working with files, there's some data that tends to be more expensive than others. Expanding permissions is generally a bad idea. Um, but that's not something we really need to worry about in this case. 
Um, and since we're talking about files, one of the things that's interesting in SharePoint is if we come all the way back up to the root, um, instead of listing the lists, I can list the things as drives. And so in this case, SharePoint document libraries are represented as both lists in the SharePoint side of the API, as well as drives that contain files from the OneDrive side of the API. Um, so when I want to work with a particular item as a file, I need to access the drives API and I can see that I can get the drives on the list and now I have a drive ID and what's really handy and that people don't always realize is if I access a particular drive, so in this case here's the, the document library for demo docs, I can actually go back and forth between the SharePoint and OneDrive representations just by adding slash list onto the end of the right. drive because I know that it it is a SharePoint list. And you want to add columns and yeah, you could add columns and and any of the other paths onto here. Um, and I can go the reverse if I have if I had started with the list and I knew that it was a document library, I can get access to its drive representation without having to reconstruct a new path, a new URL. Um, this is super useful when you're you're going back and forth um, from one context to the other and want to do multiple operations. Um, so we mentioned earlier that working with paths is sometimes easier because the IDs uh, can get a little tricky. Um, we've so far stayed in the root, which wasn't all that hard, but uh, let's say I want an arbitrary other list. So the bit of information that I have to pass in is I start with the the uh, URL of the tenant, so in this case it's contoso44a.sharepoint.com, and I'm going to put a colon here which indicates this is a path query. So it's just a special character in the string that the system will parse out, and then I'm going to pass in, pass in the path to a particular site that I know exists. So I have sites synthesizers, and that returned me that site, and again I can put another colon here and let's get the lists for that site. So now I'm working in path, which is a little easier to work with if I don't have the IDs up front or I haven't started from the API and gotten the IDs out. Um, and now I could work with the lists, I could work with the drives. I'm good to go. That's really neat. Yeah, so that shows a little bit of the basics of things you can do with files uh, using Graph Explorer or uh, the client SDKs as well. Awesome. So like anything, the best place to start is graph.microsoft.com. Um, if you click on the Get Started in the top there, you can pick your language and start playing with these APIs today.